Hello, Eastside. It's a very special feeling to be back in the house of the Lord. There are just a few people here, my family and the praise team. Uh, but I know that we, as a church family, are all connected in the spirit of Christ. Last Friday night, uh, my daughter Abigail uh, solemnly approached me with a request. And she didn't think I was going to grant it. And she gave me reasons why she thought I was going to say no. But she wanted to participate in the protests and the demonstrations going on in Seattle in response to the killing of George Floyd. I heard her out. I asked her what demonstration she wanted to participate in. I asked her to give me uh, some information about the organizers. And I told her I'd talk to Jeannie and get back to her. And Jeannie and I spoke about it. We prayed. And we gave her our answer. We said, yes, you can go. And we're coming with you. Last Sabbath, after church, we loaded up the family into the car in the driving rain and went to downtown Seattle. And Jeannie and Seth, uh, went on their own little march, uh, but I went with Tabitha, Abigail, and two of Abby's classmates, and we participated in a march that started at Westlake Center, was supposed to go to the federal courthouse, but went all the way to the International District and back. It was amazing. It was incredible to see a sea of people, hundreds and hundreds of people, marching in unity, lifting their voices against the injustice that everyone had seen on their television screens, their computer screens, their phones in the preceding days. I took part in the, char the chants, especially the ones that said, say his name, George Floyd, say her name, Breonna Taylor. A very popular chant was, no justice, no peace. And I have to be honest with you, I, that, that, that chant gave me pause. It made me uneasy. And the reason was because I had made it clear to Abby that our family would go and participate in a peaceful demonstration. So those words on their face seem to be discordant with that stated purpose and that commitment, right? No justice, no peace. It seemed to be saying that if you don't give us justice, we're not going to allow peace to occur. In the days since, I've really prayed on this and studied it, especially in preparing for today's word. And I recognize that there's a truth that resonates in that chant that struck to the very heart of why we were actually there. When there is no justice, there can be no true peace. There can be something that looks like peace, that gives the trappings of peace, that may come with economic prosperity, that may comfort, come with comfort, that may come with laughter, with good times. But if there's no justice, there can be no true peace. What you have instead is what Jesus described as the whitened sepulchers, right? Those, those grand uh, monuments that covered death and decay. That's what we were there to call out. To recognize and to declare there is no justice and therefore the peace that you hold out to be peace is no peace at all. Most everyone in civil society agrees that we need laws. Otherwise, we're going to descend into chaos, right? And no person, no property, no life, nothing worth anything is safe. It's basically called the social contract. What this nation and even now the world has recognized, the video of George Floyd's killing 
put on full display. The bitter pain, anguish, and hopelessness that comes from there being no equal justice under the law. What we've recognized now, what people have tried to ignore or gloss over, what these deaths have highlighted and exposed is that the law in America, in fact, probably nowhere in this world, is it administered equally across racial, class, and cultural grounds. I watched the video of Derek Chauvin killing George Floyd. I could hear the voices of citizens yelling at the officers, get off his neck, he's not moving, check his pulse. What's wrong with you? And you can hear George Floyd pleading 16 times, I can't breathe. You can see and hear clearly Derek Chauvin with his knee on the neck of George Floyd, almost taunting him, saying, what do you want? And George Floyd saying, I can't breathe. And then Derek Chauvin saying, then get in the car while he's pinning him to the ground by his neck. And George Floyd saying, I can't. This went on for eight minutes and 46 seconds. At one point, George Floyd cries out, Mama, Mama. <clears throat> if you come across four men in the process of suffocating a defenseless man on the ground, what would you do? You would call the police. But the cruel injustice of what happened a little over a week ago was that those concerned citizens, those who stopped and gave voice saying this is wrong, had no one to call because it was the police who was killing that defenseless man. I haven't spoken for some time, and um, I left uh, the world of criminal law about 15 years ago. But some of you know, and, and many uh, maybe don't, that I started out my career as a lawyer as a criminal prosecutor. I did that for two years, uh, and then for six years I was a public defender in Northern California, and then uh, for one year, and then five years up here in Seattle. Over the course, uh, as a criminal lawyer, both as a prosecutor and as a criminal defense attorney, I tried uh, 40 trials, uh, about 10 bench trials and, and 30 jury trials. Um, out of those 40 trials, there were four verdicts that in my heart I truly felt were unjust. As I prepared today's sermon, I thought back, uh, it's been a long time, right? But I thought back to the, the, the issues, the, the evidence, and the people involved in those cases, and I had a startling realization. Those four trials where I thought there was an unjust result all had to do with race. As a prosecutor, I had three hung juries. So out of 15 jury trials, I got 12 convictions. Uh, but three of them were hung juries. The first two had to do with uh, a DUI, and the second, a uh, boating under the influence, so a BUI, we called them. And even though, in my humble view of the evidence in the law, I felt that those defendants were dead to rights, in terms of the evidence uh, that they'd been driving under the influence of alcohol or boating under the influence of alcohol. There were enough jurors on both of those uh, trials 
where there wasn't a unanimous verdict. And as I think back, both of those defendants were white. In fact, the boating under the influence defendant uh, was actually a police officer. He was out on the lake having too many beers, and he was uh, found out and pulled over and arrested. Back then, I would interview my jurors uh, after every trial. I wanted to learn from my mistakes, see what I'd done poorly, see what I could do better with. Uh, and what struck me was just how, um, how easily right, logic and evidence and truth was brushed aside right, when jurors came up with excuses to give those two defendants a buy. The third trial I had as a prosecutor that ended up in a hung jury actually flipped everything on its head. I was a prosecutor and it was a misdemeanor offense. It was driving while license suspended. But the reason why the young black male defendant was even pulled over in the first place was supposedly because of expired taps. Now keep in mind, as the prosecutor, I'm the one trying to convict this young black male of driving while license is suspended, but the law says you have to have good cause, right? You have to have um, a reason to be pulled over in the first place. That doesn't have to do with racial profiling. Uh, it was a chilling moment during my own trial when I asked the arresting police officer about the facts of the case and about how things had transpired, that I had a conviction in my heart that he was lying. Because he said that he encountered this defendant, this young black male driving uh, uh, his white car, as he was going the opposite direction of him, right? Where are vehicle registration tabs? They're in the back, right? So this realization, and it should have been the defense attorney who jumped all over this, right? But this realization came to me as I'm asking him, okay, well then how did you know that the tabs were expired that gave you the right to pull him over in the first place, ask for his license, and see that the license was suspended? Oh, you know, as it turns out, I was at the bank earlier that day, and I recognized the car, because it was a kind of a slick white Cadillac. And I remember thinking, hey, those tabs are expired. I pay my tabs, and I was indignant. And so that stuck in my memory. So later in the day, when I saw the same car, even though it was from the front, I recognized it from the bank. I just stunk to high heaven. I felt like I was sleepwalking through the rest of that trial. Because in my heart, I believed that my main witness was a liar. The two other times I had gotten um, the hung jury uh, verdicts in my other cases, I was devastated, right? Because I'm a competitive guy. I know some of you may not know that. Uh, and I also felt like the law and the, and, the, and the facts merited a guilty verdict. So when even a few jurors uh, refused to follow the facts in the law and gave me hung, hung jury verdicts, I was really upset. But I tell you, when the verdict came back, when the jurors filed back into the courtroom for that driving while license suspended case with my heart in turmoil about my believing this police officer who was sworn to, to protect and serve, that I believed, even though I didn't have evidence of it, but I believed in my heart that he was lying. When they came back with a hung jury, I was flooded with relief. You know, it's funny because um, the one holdout in that third case was a young Hispanic male. I'm sure he could tell, like I could tell, that the officer was just lying. That fourth trial that I had, which to me felt completely unjust, actually happened when I was a public defender. 
I've tried to explain to people, uh, as a defense attorney, your job is not to... Uh, you, you don't have the job of the prosecutor, right? Which is to, to get a conviction beyond a reasonable doubt. Your, your job is to advocate for your client to the best of your ability within the law. And as a prosecutor, you're supposed to win all your trials, right? And as a prosecutor, I won just about all my trials. As a public defender, you know, if you're batting 50-50, that's like a really, that's like batting 500, right, in the, the Major League Baseball, right? And I had won about half my trials as a public defender. There's a lot less pressure, actually, right? As a public defender, it's like you want to make sure your client has due process and, and you advocate for him zealously uh, and you give him the best defense possible. But I tell you, the most pressure, the scariest case as a criminal defense attorney is an innocent client. And I believe that I had an innocent client in my young African-American client, Edward Taylor. He was accused of assault with a deadly weapon. Uh, the police officers uh, had pulled him over uh, and uh, he ran. And they claim that as he was running, as they were chasing him down, he turned around and pointed a gun at them, uh, giving him time to, to get more of a head start. And that later on they were able to apprehend him and, and find uh, a handgun in a, in a nearby yard. You know, my client Edward Taylor explained to me uh, the vicious cycle, right? Or, or how it is that so many young black males drive with license suspended. Uh, and he says it all comes down to racial profiling, right? Uh, that they're uh, uh, pulled over under any kind of pretense and given tickets for a broken taillight or whatnot or what, um, whatever um, possible citation can be given. And soon they're not able to afford their insurance and therefore they can't get their license renewed. And in essence, uh, that's why so many of he and his friends were driving around with license suspended. And he had a suspended license. At this point, this was a serious felony that I was dealing with. Uh, he told me, right? Look, uh, when they chased me down, right? First of all, I didn't point a gun at anyone. And when they chased me down and they had me in handcuffs, the officers punched me in the mouth. I've heard a lot of things from my uh, criminal defendant clients over the course of six years. Uh, I didn't um, disbelieve him, right? But certainly my question was, geez, how are we ever going to prove that? I went with my investigator to basically uh, follow the scene of the chase, right, to prepare for the trial. And as we were basically tracing the, uh, the route of the chase, this is the middle of the day in, in Seattle, a woman came out of a house and she said, oh, are you here about that incident uh, from a few weeks ago? I was like, what incident are you talking about? Well, the police were all here and there was this this big, you know, um, uh, this big to-do uh, with an arrest. And I said, well, yeah, actually, that is why I'm here. She said, oh, I saw everything. Oh, okay, what did you see? Well, uh, I was here in my room, uh, in my house, and I heard this big commotion, and it sounded like it was right outside my house. I looked out the window, and I saw two white policemen with a young black male in handcuffs and the police officer punched him in the mouth after he was already handcuffed. Blew me away. I thought, surely I'm going to be able to, to have the evidence to discredit these officers to be able to equip my client of a crime he did not commit. I had not ever worked as hard on a trial <laughs> in my life up until that point. I prepared tirelessly for that because of the stress, right, of having a client I actually believed was innocent. This is the only trial that my wife Jeannie ever came and watched. She took time off from, from work 
And she came and she watched that trial because she knew um, how fervently I believed in my client and, and how important it was to have him acquitted of these false charges. I brought every skill that I had to bear. I had the 911 dispatch call. Uh, I had um, the police reports. And over the course of this week-long trial, I believe that I had completely discredited these police officers on cross-examination alone with the contradictions and so forth that they gave in their testimony. And then we had the witness who happened to be a young white woman come and give her testimony and she had no dog in that fight, right? She was completely unbiased. She didn't know any of these people. And the police officers came in their, their smart uniforms and talked about their service uh, in the Gulf Wars uh, and looked like the clean cut boys next door you would want your daughters to date and marry. A jury convicted him. And um, when I interviewed the jurors, it just came down to they're not believing that these two police officers could lie. They had no explanation for this completely objective third party witness who said what I believed had really happened and what gave them a motivation to trump up far more serious charges against my client. Edward Taylor's family came to support him and watched him in the entire trial. He was sentenced to five years in prison. When I met with him, and his family. I expected anger and recrimination. Uh, I had let them down. Uh, I expected them to, to blame me for not being good enough, not trying hard enough. I expected them to, to rail against the criminal justice system that could be so unjust. But instead, Edward Taylor and his family thanked me for working so hard and for caring about him so much. It's as if they expected that result because their experience, their lifetime of living as members of a society where they do not completely belong, where they are not afforded equal justice under the law, where prejudices abound, where the worst is assumed about them, would result in nothing other than that miscarriage of justice. Now here we are in 2020. Obviously, in objective ways, the civil rights movement in the 50s and the 60s, we've come a long way since, obviously, actual slavery, Jim Crow laws, segregation, but what I think has happened in the past few weeks is the world has come to know undeniably that injustice continues to prevail. Where does that leave us? Edmund Burke famously said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing.
when I was um, in Northern California, uh, Jeannie and I left our jobs as a dentist and as a prosecutor to go uh, join a, a Christian health ministry uh, called New Start. And so we attended this church. It was a beautiful, large church, mostly white, just where we were uh, in a place called Grass Valley. Uh, and we were new there. Uh, we would go to church there uh, when we could, when we weren't busy uh, traveling for the ministry. And uh, it was a far cry from Loma Linda, from Southern California, right? Uh, it, beautiful, lovely people, by and large, but there um, were some who had some uh, pretty bigoted views. One day, during Sabbath school, during adult Sabbath school, uh, I was sitting there in a circle with, you know, maybe about 10 other um, adults, uh, and we we're going through the Bible study, uh, the, the lesson quarterly, and the issue of homosexuality came up. And uh, there was another attorney who's, you know, the son of the most prominent, you know, member of that church. They're very wealthy. They had all sorts of business and land holdings there. Uh, and when the issue of homosexuality came up, uh, this prominent church member used the F word to, to deride uh, the people who were homosexual. It was just, uh, my stomach went roiling, right? Um, I, I hold to the biblical teachings on homosexuality, but I hold to the character of our God. And when he said that, I was just frozen. And I was struggling, should I say something? And I decided I had to, right? I said, look, I object to your using that term, especially here at church. It's ugly and it's bigoted and it shows no compassion or caring for other people. You know, that was very difficult for me. Uh, but when I think back to that moment, I am so glad that the Holy Spirit moved my heart to say something. Believe me, it got awkward in there. <laughs> very, very awkward, and the rest of the, the lesson study was strained. But something had to be said. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters in Christ, God calls us to speak truth to power. Proverbs 29, verse 7 says, The righteous care about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no such concern. We know that silence is a sin of omission, right? We may go around and say, well, I'm not racist. I don't act in a racist fashion. I don't discriminate against people. But we hear more and more, are you anti-racist? Do you speak up? Do you do what needs to be done to stand up for truth, to stand up for those who are oppressed, to stand up for those who are discriminated against? You know, that verse from Proverbs is powerful. The righteous care about justice for the poor. But the wicked have no such concern, right? There's no middle ground, right? It, the Bible says if you have no concern about justice for the poor, for blacks, for minorities, for underprivileged, for people who are persecuted because of their sexual orientation, the Bible calls you wicked. You know, um, one of the most powerful stories about speaking truth to power is found in 2 Samuel chapter 12, right? It's a famous story about Nathan, who was called to God to come to King David a short time after he had committed the most egregious of sins, right? Not just adultery, a premeditated murder, adultery with Bathsheba, and then a horrible premeditated murder where he basically forced 
multiple people to become his co-conspirators in premeditated murder against Uriah the Hittite. And God called a prophet to be the one to speak truth to power. Right? Nathan gave this most compelling story about a man who just could only afford one ewe, a sheep, and loved it, even slept with it on its lap, his lap. But the rich man who had many, many sheep, when he had need to feed a traveler, he stole that poor man's sheep and slaughtered it. David, righteously indignant, said, who is this terrible person? That guy's going to die. He's going to pay fourfold for his injustice. And I can imagine it. Nathan, standing in front of David, the almighty king, who Nathan knew had no qualms in murdering someone who stood in the way of something he wanted. And I can imagine how it looked, right? Nathan, standing there before the throne, the elevated throne of King David. And when King David says, who is this man? Nathan says, you are that man. Are we willing to speak truth to power no matter what the consequences are? I pray that we are. You know, I shared the example, and there, and there are a few more where I felt like something needed to be said, and I did say it, but I regret to say there are times that something needed to be said when I haven't. And those opportunities to take a stand and to do what was right. But I didn't because I was worried about the blowback or about the consequences or it was just socially awkward or just difficult. Haunt me today. You think about Nicodemus, right? He came in secret because he knew that Jesus was speaking the truth and he knew the Bible and he suspected perhaps this man is the Messiah. And he came at night to question Jesus, and Jesus spoke plainly to him. And he still didn't take a stand, but later, in his heart, his conscience growing, and the Holy Spirit speaking to him about Jesus being the true Son of God, when he had the opportunity, when the Sanhedrin wanted to go and arrest Jesus and put him to death, he stood up and said, Do we go ahead and condemn a man without hearing his side? And who was it who came? to the tomb of Jesus with precious herbs and spices to embalm him. It was Nicodemus. The Bible says he brought 70 pounds of these herbs and spices. And I can imagine him weeping over Jesus, wondering, did I do enough? Did I say enough? Yeah, I stood on procedure and perhaps I forestalled this outcome but I could have done more. I could have said something until it actually hurt me. What does God call us to do in times like this? He calls us to stand up for the truth. He calls us to defend the powerless. He calls us to speak truth to power. And he calls us to give until it hurts. It's been a very, very intense, confusing time. This is not so clear-cut. It's not so easy to sort out. When my family went to that demonstration, it was powerful. I still had to sort through what chance did I feel like I could get behind. What made it even worse is when we made our way back after flashbangs were going off and, and tear gas was, was being administered. I could hardly make it back to Jeannie and Seth because there were cars on fire in the street. There were lines of police in riot gear. There were percussion grenades going off. Later, when we finally did make it home, we watched the news as we saw the looting begin. It's made for some very intense, difficult conversations with my kids. And I don't have all the answers.
people like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar are saying things like, look, uh, I'm not saying I condone the violence, but violence is the voice of those who have no voice. I listen to Up First. It's a news, store, news show on NPR every morning. And they had correspondents in every major city, right, uh, interviewing people who were protesting uh, and there's the whole range of mixed emotions about what's going on. Uh, you've got uh, evidence of, of extremist groups on the one hand, like Antifa, the anarchists, and then on the other side, the Boogaloo movement, these white supremacist groups who are seeking overthrow of the government. You have those who are just plain looting, and those who believe that violence towards property is an acceptable and necessary means to draw attention to injustice. But I heard an interview of Pastor Brian Heron of the Zion Baptist Church in Minneapolis by Noel King. If anyone listens to NPR, they'll recognize her name. And she was interviewing him, and, and, and they were trying to get at how did local activists, people who were there on the ground in the communities, how did they feel about the violence? And of course the pastor was saying, oh, this violence is evil, it's, it, it should not happen. But she then asked him a flat out question. She said, is there any part of you that still wants to get out there and burn something down? And he immediately answered, oh please, all day, every day, but for God but for God, that he makes the difference in my life. Man, you think I'm not mad enough to tear something up, to hurt some folk? But what good would that do? Who would that serve? What purpose would that serve? And Noel King concluded that segment by saying, so people who are nonviolent will tell you that after George Floyd's death, I get it. My feeling on this is that acts of nonviolent protest motivated by and proven by self-sacrificial love are what truly reflect the character and actions of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and what have the true power to create lasting change. What good did the Crusades do, right? It laid the groundwork for the enduring hatred, militancy, distrust between the Arab world and the Christian world. But how about the example of Stephen? As he's being stoned for speaking the truth to power, as he's giving up his life, his last words were, asking God to forgive his murderers because they knew not what they did. I want to close with a final scripture. Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Many commentators are saying that the grand experiment of democracy embodied by the United States, which has been the unquestioned leader since post-World War II of democracy, of freedom, of human rights, of compassion, and caring for all people has been lost. That that light is being extinguished by what we see around us and by the failures in leadership of this country. That may be, in fact, the Bible seems to prophesy that while for many years, the U.S. would be a leader 
in reflecting the character of the lamb, one day it'll become like the dragon. But we as Christians are called to continue to be a light on the hill. Why is that? What motivates us? What gives us the, the willingness to speak truth to power, even if it hurts, even if we suffer in consequence? I'll tell you why. Have you transgressed? I know I have. Jesus Christ was pierced for our transgressions. Have you sinned? Have you sinned today? Have you sinned yesterday? I know I have. Jesus Christ was crushed for my sin. As a Christian, looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ, do we do that with fear and anxiety and uncertainty? Or do we do that that enveloped with a peace that passes understanding? We do. We have that assurance of salvation. Not because I deserve it. Not because... I've done anything to merit it, not because my sins weren't enough to, to pin Jesus Christ on the cross, but because he bore our punishment. And because he bore our punishment, the wounds of sin that should be fatal have been healed. And that is the message that we take to those around us. That gives us the courage to speak truth to power, even until it hurts. And that's what will heal the rifts and the wounds and the pain that we are all undergoing today.